In this video, we're going to look at the light fixtures, light sources, the effects on both of those, as well as the RAM player as a tool for looking at alternatives. You can see from the rendering there are a number of fixtures in this file. Most of these were produced with platonic geometries. The lamp on the post was produced using the loft tool. All of the geometries take advantage of a multi subobject material type that was created, and this allows a variety of polygons to each have its own material type within a single object. The plasma screen was produced with a simple box geometry. The box geometry was then collapsed into an editable poly, and the editable poly's individual polygons were manipulated to produce what is the screen or the frame of, of the plasma monitor using inset and then the extrude tool in the negative direction. Once this has been set up in this fashion, then we want to go through and address the polygons before moving on. While still in the polygon level, I'm going ahead and select all of the polygons. So I've typed one in the set ID inside the polygon material IDs box and push the enter key. We'll then select the polygon that would be the screen and we'll give this the material ID of number three because that corresponds to the material type that I've created. So in the set ID box, we'll type three and press enter. You should always try to confirm that your polygons are addressed properly by using the select ID. So we could type in number three in here in the select ID and click select ID and we'd see it's just picking that one polygon. The tube light was produced using a cylinder geometry. That cylinder geometry then could be adjusted. I'm going to use just three segments here so we could produce the equivalent of two end caps in a body. And we only need about 12 sides for this to work just fine. We'll, like the box, collapse this into an editable poly and then select the vertices and push those around. We'll push the vertices here to the ends, just short of the ends so that we have what would be the equivalent of a couple of end caps. And then I'll select the polygons from beneath the cylinder and manipulate those with the extrude tool. So I've selected the polygons in the base of the cylinder and then use the extrude in the negative direction to produce the lens of the tube light. And like the plasma screen, I need to go through here and systematically address the individual polygons. I've chosen to give the in tubes an address of one and the body of the tube an address of two and then the lens an address of three. The dome light was produced using the sphere geometry and it also had been collapsed into an editable poly. And then in the polygon edit mode, uh, what you can do is select uh, a series of the polygons at the base and we could in fact also take advantage of soft selection which allows a fall off between selected and unselected polygons. You could increase or decrease the distance from the selected uh, polygons to soften um, any manipulation that might occur uh, of the selected polygons and then simply use uh, scale and move to reposition the polygons um, up inside and create the dome light with the lens beneath. And once again, just as in the previous two examples, uh, you want to address the dome proper with one kind of material and address the lens underneath here with a material that makes sense for what would be the light fixture. The bell lamp was produced by first drawing a line inside the Create Shapes tool set and then the line has a lathe modifier applied to it. And the lathe modifier can be repositioned manually or you can use minimum center and maximum and it just turns out the maximum extent of this profile is going to produce our bell outcome. If you'd like you can also manipulate this in real time by moving down to the line level and we could go to the vertex uh, topological level of this. If we turn on show in result you could then reposition the elements within that line and see dynamically what the outcome would be in terms of the shape of the bell. The light bulb that's contained within the bell was produced using the same process. They're two separate geometries, so each is going to get its own material. And neither will receive the multi subobject material type. The arm on the lamp produced by drawing a path and a source geometry and then using the loft tool, which is located inside the create compound objects loft. You produce the loft by selecting either the path or the source first and then 
selecting the reciprocal through the tools inside the interface here. I'll select the get shape, select my circular shape, and now my tube has been extruded along the path. Next I need to proceed by creating the materials that will be applied to these. If we go to our material editor, you'll notice that I've set up five materials inside here that are going to account for the video monitor, the frame, the lens that goes in three of the fixtures, the end caps, alternative paint color if I choose to use it. I also have a sixth material here that actually houses the multi-sub object assembly and this is produced by dragging each of these material types into a slot and using instance. By doing it in this fashion then I can maintain all of these materials independent of the multi-sub object and I might be able to apply them to other elements in the scene without having to get into the multi-sub object material type. Each of these are very simple. The blue is just a simple anastropic shader with a blue color. The white is a blend with a white color. The light lens that shows up in a number of the fixtures is just a white color with a self-illuminate turned to white. The yellow color is just a blend shader with a slightly yellow color. And finally, the only map that's been used in the scene has been applied on what will ultimately be the video monitor. And a video has been attached here as a bitmap. I've selected a bitmap, and then that bitmap is applied just like any JPEG um, or other static image within this particular channel, diffuse color. And I've then cloned by instancing that same information down onto specular level, self-illuminate, and reflection to cause the video monitor to be more vibrant when it renders. If it's just simply the color, it'll appear to be flat and not illuminating. Now I also want to point out that in two of these channels, I've added an effect. In the white light, I've added an effect by going to the material ID channel and pulling down to number one. I've just simply given this material a special address, so later on an effect will be applied to it. I've used exactly the same effect on my video screen. And then finally in my material for my multi-sub object uh, by default you get 10 slots in here. I've reduced this to 5 and the IDs, the addresses are essential and these correspond to the polygon addresses on the elements here in the scene. When it comes to the bell light, the outside part of the bell light, I simply am using the blue metal directly on it and I'm using the white light directly on the light bulb. There are also two light sources in this scene. Now while the video monitor in reality would cast some form of light and we could set up a light source out here that projects the same information that's on the screen and the tube light could also be projecting light, I've chosen to leave those out just out of convenience. Also to cause this to render so that we can actually see the geometries of the light sources You'll notice that I have placed some omni lights in the scene above so that the housing of the light fixtures will be visible. Beneath two light fixtures here, I've placed two cone lights. And both of those lights have been placed in such a way that the light source is parked up inside the geometry. This is essential because we want the cone of light to appear to project from this lens and if we put the light source below the geometry it would appear to emanate from a point. And when you tuck the light up inside a geometry like this it will be obscured by the geometry and no longer visible. So it's essential that you use the exclude button and make sure in this case the dome lights excluded from the illumination and shadow casting that goes with that cone light. The same has been done over here in the bell lamp and that light source has been tucked up inside the light bulb. The other thing that's been done on both of these lights to make them appear more realistic is that under the intensity, color, and attenuation I've used an inverse decay and we've set up an attenuation that establishes when the light begins to fall off and when it terminates. The lens shapes that you see out here represent the beginning and the end of the fall off of this light. And this would be the case if a light's out in the environment, you'd see fall off because of particulate in the atmosphere and so forth. One other important feature about lights in 3D Studio is that after a while, a number of lights in the scene will become difficult to manage. And so you can go to the tools pull down and pull down to where you find light lister. And with light lister revealed, it's possible to see all of the lights in the scene 
and make general changes to those lights without having to wade down through the interface that goes with each individual light. You'll notice that there's a whole series of omnis stacked up over here. That represents omnis that were instanced in the scene. These are the omnis I'm using for general illumination above the light fixtures. The other two light sources in here correspond to the target spotlights that have been placed beneath the dome and the bell lamps. Both of the target lights have atmosphere and effects applied to them called volume light. This causes the light to actually be seen with some sort of volume as if there was fog or particulate in the air. If we first apply this, you're not going to find anything in this box. You would click add and if you click add then a list would appear. The list would look like this. You could select in this case volume light and click OK. I already have it in here. And then once volume light is being applied to this target lamp then we need to set it up. And the setup for this is as follows. There are a number of features in here that could be adjusted but the key things that need to be set up by you are the light source that is being applied to shows up here in this rollout. So this is the bell light source that is receiving this volume light. It's important for us to set the density of this light source. So we don't want this to be too thick. It looks like it's white paint. So I have my density down to one. And it's also important that uh, you have this correlated to your attenuation. Now the other effect that's been applied here in the scene is an effect to the materials to cause them to glow. And so to have that appear correctly, I've given an ID to two of my materials here, my white light and my video. To apply that effect, I go to the rendering pull down and pull down to where it says effects. And I've set up a lens effects. Initially this would be empty and you would click add and select from a list and I've added lens effects. The kind of lens effects I've applied here is a glow. So I select glow and click on the right arrow and it's going to send glow into this box. If I want to change the attributes of my glow, I'll select the glow that's been applied and I'll roll down below and you'll see a couple of key boxes that need to be checked on. First of all, it needs to be turned on to show and this establishes the size, the radius of this glow about the material and this establishes the intensity for this to work properly, then in the Options tab, I need to make sure that my Material ID matches up with the Material ID that I'm using over here in my Material dialog. If you test a couple of options, it's always difficult to see what's the difference between one variation on the rendering and another. One way to test options is to take advantage of the RAM player. The RAM player, which you see here displayed, can be found by pulling down from rendering to where a RAM player is at the bottom. It then appears on the screen and you can fill channel A and channel B with two different versions of a rendering. You need to first render those and then save them. I have two files here called A1JPEG and B1JPEG. A1JPEG is then loaded by clicking on the open file button here and I can trace down the path to that A1 file and select and this slot will now be filled. I'll then open up channel B and fill it with a corresponding JPEG. Then turning on the buttons over here inside the interface, I'll set up an arrow, in this case a horizontal arrow that allows me to scrub back and forth between the two variations of the file. It lets me see what the scene looked like without the glow on the material and what the scene looks like with the glow on the material. 